Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. And what a beautiful day outside. Makes me want to go deer hunting <laughs> after church. <laughs> it's good to see you today. Praise the Lord. We're in our series of messages entitled Back to the Future. Before I get in my message, let me remind you, early voting does start Monday. So uh, vote early, vote often, as they say. <laughs> At least vote. All right. Uh, come, come Monday, you can vote up. I think it is till Friday. I think you get, like we get a week of early voting, but uh, take the opportunity. Uh, Reminds you that this is probably the, the choices for candidates are probably the worst they've ever been in American history. Uh, you know, it's, it's a sad day. Amen. Uh, when we look at where we are and uh, a choice of leadership. I look at these kind of situations like I do every situation. You know, what does the Bible say? So when you go in that voting booth, remember that you are a believer and there's a lot of stake. We can't continue to kill hundreds of, or well, tens of millions of babies. We wonder what happened to Social Security and what's why we have being the, the, the thought and the probability of Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security all being bankrupt in, by 2018, 2020. It's because we killed the future, you know, with abortions. And uh, even though I may not agree with a great deal of the candidates, I do know there's a lot at stake for the future concerning Supreme Court justices, concerning particular laws that need to be repealed and overturned that are uh, ungodly and at, at best. Amen. So I, I vote in regard to how I live my life. What's the Bible say? What does God want? And uh, it's not my job to tell you who to vote for, but it's my job as your pastor to tell you that, hey, you have a moral obligation before God to find out what the scripture says and what candidate stands closest to that and vote that. Amen. Amen. And not by words, but by deeds and by actions. So we're responsible as believers. To, to, to make a difference in the culture. And voting is just one of multiple ways that we make a difference in the culture. When I look at the choices for Supreme Court justices that will be falling to the next candidate and realizing that those men pretty much, uh, we making women, we making decisions that affect uh, generations to come, then we better approach that voting booth with a moral conscience and realize that, hey, there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And we need judicial people as well as legislatures, as well as candidates who will stand up for righteousness. What does, what does God say? Not go by labels, not go by political parties, but what, is, what does the Bible say? And although there, I think it becomes clear at certain points is when it comes to political parties, which are, which are promoting what, but I think that there's a lot more at stake than what most of us realize. And we better, we better approach it with a, lot, a great deal of prayer. On Wednesday nights after our service, there's a, a brief prayer meeting. If you want to come and attend that anytime, we pray for our nation following the service on Wednesday nights up here at the altar. So uh, you're free to join us on any Wednesday night and, and pray for our nation, especially this next week. It wouldn't hurt you to even fast and pray. Amen. That doesn't mean pray fast, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or pray about fasting. Fast and pray. These are, these are crazy. This is a crazy world, amen. It makes you think Jesus is coming back, which I do believe he is coming. Wouldn't it be nice if he gets here before the election? Can I have a hearty amen? amen? Somebody told me, Brother Joe, you say that kind of stuff and it offends people. I've tried to decide about everything I say offends somebody. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just want to please Jesus. As long as he's not offended, I can, I can get away with it. Amen. But we have been talking about prophecy over the last five and six weeks, and we've been talking a lot about the end times, and more than just kind of a surface approach, we've tried to really dig into the scriptures, and what does the Bible say in regard to the second coming of Jesus Christ? I would, I would ask you to raise your hand, but I think we'd probably get a majority vote this morning. If I were to ask you how many believe in the first coming of Jesus, and there really was this person who was born in time and space, who was a man named Jesus of Nazareth who himself, as well as scriptures, declares the Son of God. I believe in the first coming of Jesus Christ. The Bible predicted and foretold hundreds of hundreds of years, six, eight hundred years before he came, that he would come, that he would be born, that he would be a, a savior, that he'd be a deliverer, that he'd be Messiah. He came just as scripture prophesied and was born as scripture prophesied, lived a perfect life as scripture prophesied, died on a cross, pierced as was prophesied, rose from the dead, as was prophesied. That same Jesus is going to come back again, as prophesied. I find it difficult, people who would say, well, I don't have trouble, you know, really believing about that, uh, 
that first coming of Jesus. But that's the second. That's, there's some bizarre stuff that goes on. <laughs> Any more bizarre than God becoming a man? And dwelling human flesh? God turning his back on his son who gave us his life as the redeemer for all of us and becomes sin for us? Listen, the, the word of God is true. I trust more in those things that are written in the word of God than I do in what the weatherman tells me or what your financial advisor might tell you and definitely more than what the politicians might tell me, amen? Now, there's a lot we could say in regard to this particular section of scriptures. We're going through prophecy. We're dealing with the rapture. Uh, back in November of 2013, I did a very short series on end times. And in that series of messages, I did a sermon on the rapture but it was a little different than what I'm going to preach today. It was a sermon kind of just showing all the different views. I mean, uh, you, you know, you get two people in a room, you get four different views when it comes to Christians, all right? But there are different biblical views about the end times and the rapture. And so I dealt with that more specifically, the different views and what the Bible had to say where people might get those perceptions from and right and wrong, pros and cons of those different views. I'm not going to go into that kind of sermon today. I want to talk to you what I believe is the biblical approach to it. But before we talked about what is amillennialism, you may have heard that, you know, what is mid-tribulation rapture? What's a post-tribulation rapture? What's a pre-wrath rapture? I mean, so these different views that exist out there about when does the rapture happen? Some believe the rapture is not going to happen. Others who believe it's going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. Some believe at the end of the tribulation. Some believe there's going to be a, a split rapture. In other words, uh, if you've been a really good Christian, you go at the, the first rapture. If you haven't been such a good Christian, you're going to have to be spanked during the tribulation. By the tribulation and suffer tremendously for your misdeeds and be punished for those. And at the end of the tribulation, then the second rapture takes place. Uh, you know, people, they come up with verses and scriptures and stuff. But, you know, there's a consistency that flows in the Bible if you're just willing to study the, the whole of scripture and see what it says. Where it seems like there may be something that's out of line or something that might dis. If you study it carefully and closely and look at what's being said and to who it's being said and when it's being said, those things kind of iron themselves all out. The, the word of God really doesn't hold a contradiction. The contradiction is us and our ability to either study and perceive what God is saying or to understand what God is saying. It's never with God. There's no contradiction with him. And he, if he says one thing, that's what he's going to do. All right. So as you look at scripture, uh, we're going to look today in regard to the rapture and what I believe is the most biblical view that there will be this, uh, this, this pre-tribulation rapture that takes place. And as we've talked about events of the end times, if you haven't been here, we've talked about the great prophetic events. We've talked about the signs of the times. We've compared the contemporary evidence of today with the signs that were given by Jesus in Matthew 24 and by the apostle Paul and by other scriptures what the culture would be like, what the globe would be like. We're talked about there'd be pestilence and the famines and the earthquakes, uh, wars, rumors of wars. We dealt with all that. And remember, when, even when Jesus is speaking of those issues, he says those would be in various places, all right? But remember when the tribulation takes place, those massive events of destruction, pestilence and famines and earthquakes, those are not just kind of, you know, in various places anymore. These become global events, all right? The earth shakes, all right. There's pestilence across the globe. There's famine across the globe. There's death across the globe. So there's a difference between these pre-tribulation signs and the actual events of judgment that take place during the tribulation. I believe the tribulation is the time of wrath and that God would deliver his children from the time of wrath. And scripture says that in a couple of places. We'll look at some of that today. But I, believe, I want to take the approach that, that says, hey, that, you know, those, those big events in prophecy that have to happen that mark the end of the beginning have already started taking place. One of the greatest, and it's always, if you look at prophecy in the New Testament, it's always in 100% of the prophecies about the end times is that what happens with Israel. We talked about that last Sunday. If you weren't here, it should be on YouTube by now on our channel, all right? our BF video channel. So if you didn't watch it, I encourage you to watch it because it talks about the miracle of Israel today and how that happened and how since the time of Jesus, and prior to him by several hundred years, Israel had been conquered and defeated, all right? No longer as a nation, the Romans were in charge of Israel. There is no Israel now, it's now just Rome in general. It's one of the provinces of Rome. And how that from that time up until the mid forties of the 19th century and 1948, when Israel literally becomes a nation again, against all odds, the only, the only nation in all of history, the only people who've ever repatriated under their native tongue and native language back into their original country, are the Jews. It was a miraculous event. We've talked about that to, to, to great detail. 
Now, if you, if th these are kind of like, you know, the little tocks on the clock, you know, the, the little click marks. It's, it's like I said, uh, with prophecy, it's like pulling a, a cylinder out of a music box where the little pegs are all over the cylinder. They just in turn hit the music notes as they're turning. So God's already pegged this cylinder out. And one of those pegs on the cylinder that marks the end times was the budding of the fig tree in Matthew 24. The restoration of the nation of Israel that Ezekiel talked about in chapters 34 and 35. And all that has taken place now. First time in history has taken place. In fact, scholars and prophecy watchers for centuries have been waiting for that event because that marks the so-called beginning of the end that took place. The next big thing I think on this prophetic clock will be what we're talking about here, this event called the, the rapture. Now, there's no Bible word. If you were to go to your, get on your smart device or your computer, your tablet, whatever, and say, type in rapture and look it up in the Bible, you're not going to find a word rapture. Uh, remember that the English Bible comes after, you know, the, the Bible's been translated from Hebrew and English into other languages, Latin, Vulgate, remember? So it goes from Latin. The Latin has a, has a word in it, and we'll look at that in a minute that we get this particular word rapture from. But let's look at scripture, which is always the best place to go, amen, when we're finding out what, what does the Bible say. If we've looked at the chart, remember, we've talked about the end of times, and hopefully this is clear enough for you to see the past ages to future ages. Incarnation and resurrection take place. That's happened. The church age begins. During this period we call the church age between now and the tribulation period. These are all the signs of famines and wars and pestilence. And then you see the birth of the nation of Israel. And then somewhere after all this takes place, as we wind up and get ready for the tribulation, there's this point of great wrath. There's a time of wrath that God judges the nations during the tribulation. And we see a deliverance take place in which we call the rapture. All right. Uh, it's, it's, it's the Lord takes us up and it talks about the glorification of the saints. Somewhere in this chaos, I believe that, that ensues all these missing people ensues this taking away of the church. Can you imagine the global chaos that happens? I mean, we saw the global chaos just on 9-11. Can you imagine what happens when millions of people across the planet are suddenly missing overnight and all the chaos that takes place there? Now, what happens is the Antichrist arises to the scene at this time, resolves as we've talked about all the crisis in the Middle East. I won't go back to all that, but all the crisis in the Middle East, he comes on the scene as a, as a global peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Obviously very charismatic, very cunning, very sharp fellow. He rises to the scene and he proposes a treaty for the Middle East, a seven-year peace treaty between the Jews, the Palestinians, the Arab world, the globe, you know, because there's been such global tension that takes place in the Middle East. They, they enter into a peace treaty, and the Bible tells us that the signing of that treat, peace treaty is when the tribulation begins. Somewhere in the middle of the tribulation, he walks into the temple that he's allowed to be reconstructed, most likely according to the peace treaty, and defiles the temple and calls himself God and wants the whole world to worship him. That's when you see the mark of the beast and, you know, the number 666. No man can buy or sell or trade unless he carries this mark and bears this mark in his head or forehand. So we see all that taking place. But before that, before that happens, what's the event? I think it's the next little peg on the, on the cylinder. It's the rapture, the taking away of the church. Scripture puts it this way. 1 Thessalonians 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He's talking about those people who've died that are believers, all right? That you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. For they, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, we won't prevent them which are asleep. He goes on to say, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He's talking about an event in time when God brings from heaven all the souls of all those people who we know and love, and from days gone by, you know, the saints of old, he comes back with them. From heaven, he leaves the Father's house with all the saints and he appears in the air. Now, this is not the second coming, all right? The second coming happens later after the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes and the Bible says he puts his foot down on the Mount of Olives and he enters in through the eastern gate of Jerusalem and takes his seat as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Then a thousand year reign begins, all right? That's at the end of the tribulation. We're talking about prior 
that somewhere in, in, in the course of all these things that are happening, the Lord appears in the air with the saints of old. Their bodies, he says here, will come up from the grave, be restored into an incorruptible form. They'll put on a glorified body like Jesus had when he rose from the dead. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. So the resurrection takes place here for them. We which are alive, let's say you haven't died yet and when this happens and you're still on the planet, it says in that same moment that the Lord is going to catch you up into the air to be with them as well. Say, Brother Joe, this sounds far-fetched. Absolutely. Don't you love the Bible? You want to know what's far-fetched? God said, let there be light. Now to nothing, there was light. <laughs> that's far-fetched. No, that's Bible truth. But we, we, we have to understand if we're, we're Christians, we don't live by a truth as the world dictates it. We live by the truth of the word of God. Thus saith the Lord. That settles it, amen? What does God say? What does God will? And what does God want? This is what we call in our terminology today, the rapture of the church. Now, the Greek word here is to be caught up, all right? And it's the word harpazo. It means to take something with a violent force, like to grab something up. That's the literal terminology here. Now, the, we get this word rapture from a Latin word, rapar, which came out of the Latin Vulgate and this translation of scriptures into Latin. It was the rapar that's being caught up. It, it, the same idea, it literally means, the, be, the best translation is really to be caught up from something with a violent force. What's the force? It's the presence and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ appearing in an instant of time, in a moment, that when he comes, that his power is so incredible, it literally snatches every cell, every molecule, no matter what kind of corruption it has gone through in the grave, out of the earth and reconstitutes it supernaturally into the body that it used to be, but even something far better into a glorified body. The same type of thing happened to Jesus at the resurrection. Dead, but yet now he lives reconstituted supernaturally. It's called in another place when Paul writes to young Titus, he says, listen, we are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our savior, Jesus Christ. He said, there's going to come a moment. And I believe prior to the tribulation, when judgment's about to fall on the earth, that the Lord comes for his children. Now it doesn't say prior to any persecution or prior to any tribulation problems, like not the, the, we're talking about the great tribulation, yes, delivered from that, but it doesn't mean that you're not gonna have difficulty. In fact, 65% of the church today goes through persecution, crisis, and difficulties, right? There's a problem with, 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 with Christians all over the world, they're hated. All over the world, they're pursued. All over the world, they're rejected. All over the world. In many places, it's against, uh, it's against the will of uh, the people and the will of the nations for Christians to practice their religious freedoms. So there's persecution. So it doesn't say that those times won't come or that they will not be real. The key to understanding this is a passage where Jesus is giving in Matthew 24. We talked a lot about Matthew 24 and all the signs of the time. He gives a little clearer insight. He says, the coming of the son of man will be just like the days of Noah. In the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did not understand until the flood took them all away. So it was too late. So will the coming of the son of man be? There'll be two men in a field. One will be taken and one will be left. There'll be two women grinding in the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Jesus is saying there's going to come an event that's just going to literally separate, you know, it's going to separate the, 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 the wheat from the shaft, so to say. He's going to take away believers. Who are the two men in the field? Well, one's obviously a saved person. One's an unsaved person. Who are the two women grinding? One's a saved woman. One's a person who doesn't know Jesus. Now, there are some Old Testament illustrations for this. If you look at scripture, you'll see a lot of Old Testament illustrations that not only has the Lord done something like this on a very small scale, but that the Lord is capable of doing something like this. Enoch's a picture in Hebrews 11. What in the world happened to Enoch? By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, I like this word. It uses it several times, translated, translated, translation. Now we think about translation. Somebody speaks one language you know, and, and somebody trans and translates it to another language. I've, I've spoken with translators in several different languages over the years, from Norwegian to Bulgarian to German. I mean, and so I get up and speak English, they translate it. What are they doing? They're transferring it to, to, for, so that people that I'm speaking to can understand it. 
What does the Lord do? He literally transfers, all right? There's a transfer that takes place. He, he's transferring Enoch from the planet to the heavens. It's a miraculous moment. It's a moment in time where God does something unique. He literally rearranges the location of Enoch. This is what's going to happen at the rapture. You say, well, how'd that happen? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not God. I just know it can happen. Elijah is another great picture of this. We know the story of Elijah. Elijah and Elisha, the prophets, are walking along together. In 2 Kings, it says this in chapter 2. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire, horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up into heaven in a whirlwind. There we get another little preview of what it's going to be like. Someone's going to be in the field and all of a sudden they're not going to be in the field anymore. Now when it talks about chariots of fire and horses of fire. Remember the Old Testament illustration of fire is always a reference to the fiery glory of God. All right. So this glorious light, this glorious presence appears and Elijah is taken up. Elijah's left. There's another picture, which I think is probably even more appropriate for the day that we live. And it's the story of Lot. All right. Uh, Lot is, is a great picture of a, of a backslidden Christian. All right. It says that when Lot was given the choice, remember by Abraham, you, 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 remember their, their herds we were having conflicts and they said, we need to separate these guys. So I'll go one place, you go another place. I'll give you first choice, says Abraham to Lot. Lot looks at the city of Sodom and the bright shady lights are just attractive. And he says, I think I'll go that way. Now here's what happens when we as Christians decide we're gonna go the wrong direction to the world, not continue going deeper with God, but going the other direction. And you know, I think, hopefully as well as I know, that as a Christian, you're either headed one direction or the other. You can be a worldly carnal believer, the Bible says. Now, you'll be chastened and you'll not be happy and you're not going to be blessed by the grace of God in your life the way God wants to bless you. It's going to be a difficult path. But you, like Lot, you can, you know, get the world in your eyes and pitch your tent towards Sodom. In Genesis, it says he was, he was just outside. He wasn't there yet. But follow him through this, this story in Genesis Ultimately, he moves to Sodom. And then, according to Genesis 19, he's sitting in the gates with the officials, which means that he himself is most likely official. So now he's taken office up in Sodom. It just started by living out here, then moving forward and moving closer. And then when it came time, he knew judgment was coming. He seeks to warn the others. They don't listen to him. They laugh at him. They consider him a fool that judgment's coming. Look at the crazy Christian. This, this, is, this is the importance, folks of living in the day that we live in right now, during, during this period of time, which I believe God is working very uniquely in through his children who will let him. As Christians, as believers, we have got to be committed. It's the lack of commitment on the part of so many Christians that causes the world not to believe the message. They look at your life and they see inconsistency, then they're not really gonna be paying any attention to what you have to say. It's the difference in you that makes the difference in the power of your testimony. It's the uniqueness of your life that gives a convincing edge to what you have to say. And if you're going to be like everybody else and act like everybody else and do like everybody else, then the world's not gonna believe you any more than they did Lot in the situation. Ultimately, Genesis 19, he's delivered from Sodom. So it's like so many Christians today, it's a sad deal. Now, another illustration we looked at already, but I'll bring it back into to mind to show that it is, is an Old Testament illustration. Jesus is using it in the New Testament when he talked about Noah. Life is going on as usual, basically, until the flood comes. Life is going on as usual until the flood comes. A lot of people are going to go about their business as usual until the judgment falls. And God delivered Noah in the ark. Well, the ark that we have today is Jesus himself. We need to run into the ark of God's covenant and of God's grace and God's mercy and receive the salvation that he offers us so that in the time comes that we'll be delivered from the judgment that's to come. Now, understand, those are Old Testament kind of pictures of what it would be like for this deliverance from wrath. But then the New Testament, there's some very clear promises. In John 14, Jesus is speaking. This is prior to the day he's gonna be crucified and he says to, the, to those disciples, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. You can just underline that and mark it down as a fact. He will come again. And when he comes, he's gonna receive you unto himself that where he is, you may be also. 
This was his promise. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the character of God nor the authority of God's word, but the scripture makes it clear in more than one place that God is a God of his word, that God operates with you and interacts with you on the basis of his word. You're saved by grace because the promise of the word of God, all right? God made a promise to you. If you repent and you believe, you can be saved. So you, you're saved on the basis of your faith and your, your trust and, and your belief in God's word. This is what the Bible says in his word. So as much as God would save you, deliver you from your sins, he's made this greater promise to you. I know a lot of times when people give their heart and their life to Christ, if you've done that, you did so probably at a crisis moment in your life and you realize my life is really out of sorts or I'm not right with God. I know I'm not right with God. I am a sinner. I understand I'm a sinner. And it could have been at the age seven or 17 or 70, who knows? But man, you had this moment, a realization and revelation that you're not what God has called you to be nor are you what God wants you to be. And you need, to, you need a change in your life and only Jesus can do that. And you gave your heart to Jesus. You trusted in what he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You took God in his word. All right. Now you probably weren't thinking about this promise. You know, you might've thought, well, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell and I want to go to heaven. But in reality, your salvation includes all of this, not just to be forgiven, not just to have your heart and your life changed right now, not just to have all your sins washed away, not just to have your address changed from hell to heaven, but ultimate, your ultimate salvation where he comes, receives you into himself, glorifies your body, makes you this totally different kind of eternal being and you live forever with him, All right? So you had this promise of salvation. The Lord makes it clear as to how far that goes with this promise. Hey guys, it, it includes a change of address. <laughs> it includes a change of your eternal home and your eternal destination. So we have the Lord's promise of it. What great, I mean, if this is all we had, this would be enough. This would be simple. This would be clear, but it goes further. I mean, there's these promises as the Holy Spirit speaks to these, these, these authors of the New Testament. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says this. I want to show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, which is about a nanosecond, all right? At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Why? Because this corruptible is just continuing to corrupt. This mortal is continually, this mortally decaying. There's nothing eternal about this body we're living in, all right? This is just a shell at the present stage of everything. But God's gonna take that shell if you're alive when he returns and he's gonna transform it. All right. If you're not alive, if you're dead and in the ground, your soul is with the Lord because the scripture tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's going to come with you. Hey, and that shell is going to come back up and be united to the nut. All right. <laughs> They're going to be together all of a sudden. And it's going to be made new for believers. They're raised. And in this moment, they're put on incorruption. Why? Because God's an incorruptible God and God's a holy God. So we have to experience this transformation in these bodies where they're no longer susceptible to sin, but they're changed. Now, this is the word of scripture. He also writes the Thessalonians and he says, and I've read some of this before, but he says, far from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God is spread abroad. He said, I've heard about you guys and you love Jesus. So I don't need speaking there. But you know yourself, show us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turn from God, from idols, turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So you've been saved, you're repentant. Everybody knows, but you've also been called to wait for the son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. What's he saying? Now we've turned from idols, we've turned from our sin, we've turned to God, and now we're waiting, what? We're waiting for his son from heaven who's going to raise us up and bring him to himself and deliver us from the wrath to come. It's another one of those passages I believe that teaches us it's going to be before the tribulation, before the time of wrath. So we're going to be saved. Something's going to happen. In fact, he puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself, who? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout 
with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Underline this, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is, this is what it's all about, folks. This is, this is why God saved you in a nutshell, all right? For you to ever be with him in eternal fellowship with him. So there, there's this moment. Now, Paul referenced it in 1 Corinthians, that passage I just read a while ago, where he talked about a mystery. Remember, he says, he said, uh, uh, behold, I show you a mystery. Now he makes another reference about a mystery here in 1 Corinthians 2. A mystery in the New Testament, and there's about seven or eight mysteries that are mentioned, depends on who you talk to, how many there are. Some look at one and make two out of it. But the idea there are things, in other words, that weren't necessarily revealed, all right? But now in this age where Jesus actually inhabits people and the Holy Spirit lives in us, that we're able to see that God's revealing things to us that we just didn't quite understand. One of those things was the mystery of the church. The Old Testament prophets didn't understand the mystery of the church necessarily. They knew, and God led them to speak, how that Gentiles would be saved. And how that the Jews would be the one who would influence the salvation of many Gentiles. That happened after the resurrection of Jesus. Peter went and spoke to the Gentiles. God told him to remember the vision of the sheep being lowered. And God said, don't call unclean what I call clean. You go do what I tell you to do. He raised up the ministry of Paul to be to the Gentiles for the most part. He was rejected by a lot of Jews because of that meant because they didn't understand it. It was a mystery to them. But as we have scripture unfolded to us and the Holy Spirit living into us, he begins to reveal to us what some of these mysteries are. One is this, this, this issue of the rapture. What, 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 what was this all about? We knew that the Lord would come for the saints, but how would that happen? So the mystery begins to be unpeeled, so to say, and revealed to our eyes so we begin to a little, little glimpse of it. Here's the way he put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for they had known it, they wouldn't crucify the Lord of glory. And by the way, just as a little insight, he's talking about, this is, when he talks about princes, it's like principalities and powers. In other words, if the demonic forces had knew, had known what they were doing when Jesus was crucified, they'd never let that happen. You know, they would, but he, he couldn't see the glory of God nor the wisdom of God and all that God was doing. But God has showed those things unto us, all right? But it is written, I hadn't seen nor ear heard, neither has entered the hearts of man the, the thing which God has prepared for them that love him. But catch this, but God hath revealed them to us by a spirit, for the spirit searches all these things, yea, the deep things of God. So the more that we come through the word of God and God gives clarity to us through his, the word, nothing in the New Testament contradicts anything in the Old Testament. It just gives greater light to what's happening. So we see now that we can understand some things that we didn't understand before. And one of those things, you know, one of the great mysteries that is mentioned is this issue of the rapture. You know, I show you this mystery. He said, I, I, we're not all asleep. We'll all be changed. In the moment, twinkling when I, you know, the, the, the last trump's going to sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We'll all be changed for the corruptible must put on the incorruptible. Mortal must put on immortality. So he said, Here, here's one of those great mentions, the, the, those great mysteries. There's, there's another mention of this particular mystery, uh, mystery in 1 Thessalonians when he said, I wouldn't have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He said, in other words, if you have people you love that are Christians that have died, don't grieve like the rest of the world grieves. Why do we not grieve like the rest of the world grieves? Because we're going to see those we love again. Because the Lord, he says, is going to bring them with him. All right? God's going to bring them for the, for the reunion. And when he comes with them, he said, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord, we're not going to prevent those which have, which have died, or which, he used the word sleep here. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. We read this a while ago. What happens? Then the dead in Christ rise first. Then we're caught up to be with them in, in, in the air. To meet the Lord, so shall we ever be with the Lord. What do we do? Don't grieve like the rest of the world grieves. Comfort one another with these words. Because those we have supposedly, we use the word lost. We, they're not lost. We know where they are, you know. Those that we have seen pass before us that know the Lord, we're going we're to see them again. There's going to be a grand family reunion one day of those who know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, take a big breath. This is the word of God. This is the promise of God. This is, this is, this is in black and white in the word of God. Just as much as how to be come to Christ, just as much as I, the gospel message of salvation is in the word of God, this is in the word of God. So if I believe one, I believe it all. 
I believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I, I, I kind of believe the map's in concordance too almost, you know. <laughs> this is the Word of God. It's time that we believe the Word of God. It's time that we receive the Word of God. Let's, let's say it's going to happen at 3 o'clock today. Let me tell you how it's going to happen, how you'll know. First of all, we'll call this the order of the translation events, the transfer events, if you want to call them, all right? The rapture events. One, the Lord comes from the Father's house, according to the passages that we've shared. He comes to receive us unto himself. First action, he resurrects those who are dead in him. That's the, the deceased believers. The dead will rise first. Dead bodies restored. They're united with their bodies, all right? They're put, their spirit and their bodies once again are united in a new glorified body. Remember this body, if you say, well, what's a body like? Well, it's like Jesus' body when he was resurrected. They'll be resurrected. We'll be experiencing a resurrection from this world to the next and we'll be changed. And just as Jesus had a glorified body, you know, we're going to have this kind of, uh, of glorified body as well. Uh, the Lord shouts, see he sends, says with a loud command. Uh, maybe it's rise, all right? Uh, maybe it's like Lazarus, come forth, the loud command. He comes from heaven with this loud command, the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God called and the dead in Christ at this command. The dead in Christ come out of the graves in these incorruptible bodies that God has given him. Now, this is done in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. The twinkling of an eye, scientists tell us, is about less than a nanosecond, faster than you can bat your eye, a twinkle of your eye. That's how fast this takes place. What happens in that moment, in that instance, is we hear the voice of the archangel. All right. Whatever that voice says, we don't, I, I don't know. Again, but we also hear a trumpet sound. Now, some people who mess up on the rapture view usually mess it up right here because it talks about the trump and they confuse this with the seventh trump of the revelation seal. And those are two different things, all right, in scripture because they have two different scenarios and two different settings. This is the seventh trumpet takes place in the time of wrath. This is prior to the time of wrath. This is just the trump of the Lord. Then it says in that moment, you that are alive, after the dead have gone forth, you, you that are alive, hopefully me too, we're changed into an incorruptible form. Someone asked me the other day, Pastor Joe, what's on your bucket list? Y'all know what that is, right? What do you want to do before you die? Y'all have a bucket list? What's on my bucket list? The rapture. <laughs> that's what I want to do before I die. Just bring the rapture on that. I'm ready for that. That's, that's all I'm looking forward to is being with Jesus in that instant. And if not by, by, by the rapture, it'll be by death and be raised at that point. But I'll be out of here before you, if you're still alive at that point. Amen. These, this, is, this is the order of minutes. What happens? It says, at that moment, then we are caught up to be with the Lord. This is what the Bible talks about when it talks about this glorification, corruption, putting on incorruption, mortality, putting on immortality. It, it, it says we, at that moment, we meet with the Lord in the clouds. We meet with the other saints in the air and thus so shall we ever be with the Lord in this incorruptible body. Look at the life of Jesus after the resurrection. He comes forward in this incorruptible body now and this, this, this body that can't be affected by sin. It can't be affected by death. It can't be affected by pain. It is completely supernatural. He eats with them. He walks with them. He talks with them. But at the same time, he's not bound by time and space. You know, he can be in Galilee the next instant and the back in the next instant in Jerusalem. That's traveling the way I like to travel without TSA. Amen. <laughs> That's moving through the line pretty fast. He eats with them. Hallelujah. The Bible says we're going to eat with the Lord in the wedding feast. Fajitas, by the way, if you didn't know. i got to be in scripture. <laughs> we're going to be with the Lord forever. And this is reality. This is truth. This is not a pipe dream says we meet with them. There's a reunion and then we meet with the Lord and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. Amen. Man, what great promise. Somebody ought to praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's, that's why the old preacher said, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. That's what he meant. This is the upper taken. This is the moment when radical, you say, I just don't understand that. Well, I, man, if, if you do, I'll make you president. <laughs> Our, we can't wrap our minds around that, how God can take and restore all, all the cohesion of all those atoms and all those cells and molecules of a body that has, has been corrupted by the grave and turned into ashes and dust, but yet he brings them all together. But remember, this is the same God 
who made the atom, who put together the whole molecular processes anyway. This is the God of all things. This is not a hard deal for him. It's just a matter of speaking it. And when he speaks it as he comes, it happens. And so he said, let there be light, and there was light. And let there be oceans, let there be dry land, let there be stars, let there be moon, let there be sun. And it happened. It's the same thing here, folks. It's the God of glory and the God of might. Now, lest you misunderstand this message today, let me just wrap this up real quickly. Who is the rapture for? Well, it's not for everybody. All right? It's not for everybody. According to 1 Corinthians, it says those who are Christ at his coming. If you're here and you're alive and you belong to Christ, it's for you. Now catch that. That's, that's pretty powerful terminology because some people, when they really think it through, they don't like that. You are not your own anymore. The idea was well, my body, I'll do what I want to. I'm sorry, it's not either. Your body belongs to the Lord and your body is the, holy temple, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says you've been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit because they are His. So my, your body doesn't belong to you. Do whatever you want to do with it. Your body belongs to the Lord. You honor the Lord with it. So you are his that is coming. And then he goes on to say, not only them, he says, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, those who are asleep in Jesus. That doesn't mean those of you who are asleep are here right now. You know, kind of snoozing through the service because you stayed up too late watching TV last night. Those are asleep means those who, that's the, the metaphor for saying that your body is asleep. You're with the Lord, all right? You're with the Lord. Those who've died, that's for them. It also says, it clearly states in these passages, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, those who belong to the Lord, those who are the saved, those who are redeemed, it has to do with those people who are clearly born again. Now, what does that mean? It means that God's not coming just for good people. Because there are no good people. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, Brother Joe, I'm not too bad. Well, you're bad. The level of it, I don't know. You probably know more than I do, but you mark it down. You say not too bad, that still means you're bad. Right? You have a bad issue, and that bad issue is called sin. The only way to deal with sin is the cross and the blood and the Savior and redeeming power of Jesus Christ by giving him your heart and your life. So give your heart to Christ. It doesn't mean he's coming for the Baptist. I know some people thought that's what it meant when it says the dead in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> All right? Or the Methodist, or whatever it might be. He's not coming for church members, so to say. He's coming for covenant members, those who've given their hearts and their life to Christ. He's not coming for people who've just prayed to prayer, or been baptized or sprinkled or confirmed or gone through some you know, class at church that says it's certified they, they know all the information. He's talking about people who've committed their heart and their life to Jesus Christ. The, the Bible word is simply put, believe. You say, what does God want me to do? He wants you to believe. Believe what he said. Put your life in his hands and follow him. That's the simplicity of the gospel, is it not? That's the grace of God. God, you know, we get so wrapped up Catholic and Protestant and this and Episcopal and Methodist and Baptist. God doesn't worry about titles, folks. The only one that matters is the name of Jesus. Do you know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior? You know, that's what it really gets down to. I'm Christian long before I'm any denomination. I'm Christian. Amen. I'm Christian before I'm any political party. I'm Christian. And that defines everything else I do because I'm a believer. So he tells us here in this passage, he's ready to take not the pretend believer, but the real believer. Not just a moral person, but a person who has had a change. Not a person who just got wet in the baptistry, but a person who's had a heart change. And it wraps it up. And I, these are just repeat scriptures, but I think it's important to close with these verses. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, there it is, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another these words. In 1 Thessalonians, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So this is where you distinguish very clearly the difference between the great appearing of the Lord when Jesus comes to rule on the planet. That coming of the Lord... It's when every eye shall see from the east to the west be like the lightning flash from the east to the west. It says every eye is going to behold. All right? You're going to know Jesus is on the planet. This is a different moment. He'll come as a thief in the night when people are saying, you know, that uh, there's peace and safety. And sudden destruction comes. And just as travail upon a woman with a child, they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. The day should overtake you like a thief. 
You are all the children of light. Now, you ought to be ready for this. You're the children of the day. We're not of the night. We're not of the darkness. Therefore, don't let us sleep like others do. But watch, be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that get drunk, well, they get drunk in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. Put on the breastplate of faith and of love. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. There it is. Very clearly put. What are we doing? Be sober. What's that mean? Get your head out of the sand. Jesus came the first time. He's going to come again. He said he'd come. He did. He said he's coming back. He's coming back. Be sober. Get your thinking right. Get your thinking right about where you are in your relationship with God, where you are in relationship to the culture. Are you, getting, are you trying to live like a lot and keep getting a little closer to the world and a little closer? And try to have just as much as God to clear your conscience but not really get too much, you know? Then you don't get too close, get too fired up. He said, you need to think straight about this. This is the word of God. The Bible says this, be sober. In other words, it's going to happen. Get your thinking right about it. Don't think, well, that's just some preacher's perception. Listen, that's not my perception. That's what the Bible says. We didn't take anything out of context if we just read what it said and talked about it. That's what it says. It, you know, it says what it says. Pretty clear. It says that. So be sober. Put on the helmet. He says of your salvation, but he also talks about the breastplate of your salvation and your hope. In other words, there's going to be trouble. There, you're, you're, you have to have your, your weapons ready and your armor on. Live for Jesus. Deal with the problems. Deal with the temptations. Press through to be what God's called you to be. There's going to be a battle. Just live for Christ because you have a greater hope like none of the world has hope. We have the hope of salvation. In other words, he which began a good work in you, as Paul told the Philippians, you got saved, will complete it will perform it. All right? He starts with you here. He's taking you all the way to here. To salvation and deliverance. Hallelujah. That's good stuff. I don't know about you, but man, I'm just going to chew on that all day long and praise the Lord about it. Jesus is coming. I don't know about you. I'd only ask you this. Are you ready? If it were to happen today, if it were at three o'clock today, some of you think, thank God the Texans aren't playing. I could might make the rapture then. If the game goes into overtime, I'd miss it. You better get your, your game in order, buddy. Are you ready? The Bible says that when he appears, there's another passage, there'll be those who would be ashamed. I believe that's talking about Christians. Shame because we didn't invest our life, our time, our talents, our treasures in things that were important to God's kingdom. We were just cared about ourselves. So God's given these messages and he's been faithful to give you a word today to encourage you about the days that are coming ahead. And yeah, things look desperate in our nation, don't they? They look desperate in the world. But hey, there's a bright day coming. There's a glorious day coming. So we can have courage and we can, we can be encouraged in the day we live in. We serve a mighty God and if he's able to do all we know he did already, he's able to do what he said he'd do to finish this story because he will finish it. Let's stand with our heads bowed.